<laughs> so, uh, yes, I'm joined today. I was just telling our listeners about the fact that, uh, obviously, this week is Trustee Week. And uh, as part of our organisation, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we um, touch that with both hands and let people know all about Trustee Week, especially the younger people, and let them know about the fact that there is this thing available to them uh, called being a trustee and what it entails. And the only way to do that is let's talk to some real trustees. Now, Ian here is uh, one of several I'm going to be interviewing today. Well, first thing I'd like to know, Ian, is how does, um, and I want to get this right, um, a member of the water and environment profession uh, become a trustee of Celtic Harmony? <laughs> yeah, um, I've been involved with what became Celtic Harmony uh, right from the start. We oh, okay. at our one of our recent trustee meetings, we um, we were talking about how it all started, and we suddenly realised we've been going thirty years. Wow. Um, I I worked for the Environment Agency, managing about six hundred and forty miles of river um around Hertfordshire and South Bedfordshire and West Essex yeah and um one day a girl called Claire Holt got in touch with us um she'd got this wacky idea that she wanted to use the savings that she'd built up she was in her early 20s she wanted to use the savings that she'd built up to um to start an educational project where the urban young people would come out into the countryside and experience uh, being in the countryside for, for many of them for the first time. And the theme to hang the whole thing around was prehistory, the Celtic England, Celtic yeah. Britain. Um, and she was looking for sites. So she particularly wanted a site that had woodland and water and was reasonably secluded so it wouldn't be interrupted. Um, and she wasn't having a lot of success. So she got in touch with the Environment Agency and it ended up coming across my desk. Um, and uh, that's how it all started, really. I, yeah. I had a long chat to her and liked what she was trying to do. Yeah. Spoke to my boss at the time about it and said, do you mind if I spend a day with her showing her around sites? Because I knew the rivers of Hertfordshire intimately and lots of, um, lots of areas where there was woodland and water. And he said, well, as long as it doesn't interfere with the rest of your work, then knock yourself out. Yeah. Um, we went round, spent a day together, um, chatting all the time and getting to know each other, looked at lots of sites, and I thought that was the end of it. And then a few weeks later, she contacted me again and said um, she'd found a, a different site, one that, uh, that we hadn't looked at, which she was interested in. But she she'd got funding an offer of funding from the prince's trust to start the thing up but she needed a, a um, business mentor for it and prince's trust normally have different mentors but um but nothing that really fitted this because it was such an unusual project yeah my background's all farming as well as working for the environment agency i i ran a farm at the time and only recently retired from it so she suggested to, she said, would I be interested in taking that role on? Um, and I said, well, yeah, I'll give it a go. Uh, suggested it to the Prince's Trust and they they interviewed me. They were happy with me. So they put me through training for that. Oh, wow. And I was uh, her business mentor for the first three years to try and get the thing off the ground. So you've been there even before the beginning? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So then I couldn't get directly involved with running the thing while I was working for the Prince's Trust on, on behalf of the Prince's Trust as mentor. You yeah. had to maintain a professional separation. Of course. But once that finished, that was a three-year agreement. Um, after A couple of years after that, uh, Claire asked me whether um, whether I would join her in, in the management structure to, to help her to develop things. Yeah. And I've been involved in various forms ever since. Um, it went from being a, a sort of ad hoc project to a community interest company to a, a not-for-profit company. And then we took the big step in 2014 of formally becoming a charity. And that, that then changes the whole basis for everything because if you're a trustee of a charity, 
you have all sorts of um, professional obligations in terms of your your responsibility and your corporate governance. Yeah. So, um, so myself, Claire, uh, her husband, Luca, who was involved with the project as well by then, uh, and two other um, trustees went along to formal training. We spent um, half a day at Stansted Abbots being uh, taken through what's involved in being a trustee. Yeah. And getting a better understanding of it all. And wow. And been trustees ever since. So yeah. coming up 10 years now. Had you, had you been a trustee of anything beforehand? Nothing at all. All right. So this, this literally was your <laughs> not only your first foray, but you went in with both feet. Yes. Yes. Absolutely, uh, yeah. If you're going to do it, don't, don't that, do it by halves. Yeah, having said that, at least I, because I've been involved right from the start, I thoroughly understood the project. Yes, of course. So you and, didn't feel so immense. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it so, is a bit of a it is a bit of a stark jump though when someone sits you down like that and takes you through the responsibilities of being a trustee because it's quite a responsible position, mm. um, and trustees need to be aware of that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, back in return. Um, and since then, have you like dipped your toes in the water of trusteeship for any other organisations, or just this one? Because it's quite, you know, it sounds like something a, a bit of a, a, a passion project as well. Yeah. Um, at the moment, no, I'm I'm not a trustee of anything else. Although I have considered um, a couple of roles that involved trusteeship. Um, yeah. And in my, although I no longer work. Um, can do paid work in the the water sector um i'm a chartered water and environment manager and um member of several um technical panels and things like that uh, from that point of view so although that's not trusteeship it is um advisory to to yeah. professional standards committees and things like that so it has the same sort of feel to it and during one of the conversations that I've been having recordings of uh, on the lead up to trustee week, uh, I was talking with one trustee last week and we came up with the idea that being a trustee is almost like being like another way of calling it is being part of a focus group. Mm-hmm. Um, would you agree with that from your point of view of being a trustee over the years? That's certainly one aspect of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's also a bit like being a um an aunt or uncle to a project or a grandparent yeah. project where it's not actually your project. You don't run it as such, but you're there to support the people who do. Yeah. Um, in practical terms and um, uh, sort of physically and morally. Yeah. And to make sure that they're they're heading in the right direction all the time. Yeah. And because one of the things that we've been been discussing over the last few weeks is like um, there's how to get around this perception, especially with younger people, that um, trusteeship isn't for them. Um, When every single trustee I've spoken to has said, well, actually, no, the exact opposite is true. Um, And other trustees of organisations would love to get younger people on board. Yeah. Um, just so they can get a broad spectrum of, you know, knowledge and ideas and thoughts about the direction of their organisation. What would you say to that? I'd agree entirely. Um, mm. I think you really need a, a breadth of of um, individuals in the trusteeship roles in an organisation. It's it's useful to have someone um, or a few people who are uh, older and with specific skill sets, depending on what the organisation is that you're trustee of. Um, so I bring a very sort of business background and an environmental background to our trusteeship at Celtic Harmony. Uh, but we've got um, another trustee whose career was, he's retired as well, but his career was entirely in the insurance sector. So that's quite useful. Hmm. We've also got a trustee who happens to be older, but wouldn't necessarily uh, have to be, who is also one of the the frequent um, maintenance volunteers on the site. 
Right. And he's able to bring insight to the trustee team on the day-to-day -day operation of the, of the site, almost from a sort of staff member point of view. Yeah. Uh, well, you could do that from any age. Um, and also, if you if your role is engaging with, perhaps if your role is engaging with younger people anyway, then it would be very useful to have someone with that. Yes, that's experience. exactly what I was thinking, yeah. On the trustee board. Yeah, more so pertinent for someone like Celtic Harmony than it would be for, I don't know, Help the Aged, just purely because yeah. of your uh, service user engagement. Yes, yeah, it yeah. depends what the organisation is, really. Yeah, and uh, and having a few younger people uh, sort of uh, starting out on their work career, um, it would be beneficial to them as well, would you not say? Yes, yeah. Um, it's, from an employment perspective, it's a very good thing to have on a CV. Mm. Uh, it, it indicates that you're actively engaged in the community, you're willing to give back, um, and that you're sort of um, competent and proactive and and trustworthy. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I would see it as quite a positive thing in, in a young person for a career point of view. So um, is um, Celtic Harmony um, fairly on the lookout for uh, trustees at the moment? At the moment, um, we've just appointed one because we've had a trustee who's had to leave. Right. Um, we've had the discussion a few times about how many trustees we should have. And we're not a particularly large organisation. Oh, I think um, last year we turned over somewhere about three quarters of a million pounds. Um, and there are five of us trustees at the moment, including Claire and Luca, who um, who actually run the, the company day to day, the charity yeah. day to day. Um, we we talked when um, when Keith stepped down, we talked about how many trustees we should have. And it's always good to have an uneven number, because if you have to vote on anything, then you don't get a hung result. Um, but there's also requirements in the um, the charity regulations about employees of the charity not holding certain posts, right? In terms of trusteeship, so there has to be enough trustees who who don't include the um, Claire and Luca who are actually managing the thing. Yeah. Um, and we we decided that five really for us was a minimum. But if um, so, we needed to appoint someone else. But if a, um, a good candidate came along, then we would probably consider more. Yeah, and the age wouldn't be a bar to that, right? And um, and also um, another thing that came up uh, during other conversations is not just about the young people, but um, loads of people volunteer. And as we saw, because part of our organisation is a volunteer uh, recruitment um, thing for all of the other local uh, charities and play people organisations that are members of uh, Support for Decorum here where we uh, are in Hemel. And of course, during the recent pandemic, we were kind of instrumental in getting um, people volunteering for the vaccination centres that we had here in Hemel Hempstead. And yeah. as a result of everyone being locked down and that sort of thing, we had thousands upon thousands of applicants <laughs> wanting to, and it really highlighted um, the volunteering thing. And of course, since then, you know, we've tried to ride that wave of popularity and uh, make sure that people stay interested in volunteering. But the one thing that we've noticed, well, I mean, we've had an upsurge in volunteering of like gardening and working in shops, you know, for there's loads of um, hospices, for instance, that all have shops that people can go and volunteer in. The, the one thing there always seems to be this block, though, when it comes to the trustee part, they go, oh, no, uh, that's that's not really for me. And it's um, and I always find it they, they there seems to be this kind of, I don't know, almost fear of getting into something that's maybe a bit too big for them or something. I don't know. Have you noticed, come across that? Um, with with us not having had much in change in oh, the way right, of trustees yeah. since we became a charity, I can't really say that I've I've been in that position. Right. Uh, but I can remember formally becoming a trustee myself um, and a bit of trepidation around it. Yeah. Um, you'd imagine it might be daunting for someone who's only ever 
done kind of working, uh, volunteering in a charity shop and then all of a sudden being presented yeah, in the box. Yeah, it, depends. A, a it would depend on the individuals how confident they were, really. Mm. Um, but I think I, what I would suggest is if anyone's considering it, it would be to approach an organisation and if they're open to it, then sit in on a trustee meeting and see what's involved. Absolutely. Talk to yeah. interesting trustees. Which leads me nicely on to my next question, which was, um, what would you say to a young person just starting out on their, you know, work in life in their early 20s, maybe, um, looking at, you know, because I mean, I, I don't know about you, but when I was in my early 20s, I wasn't entirely 100% sure of which direction my life was going. <laughs> um, and uh, And I was just wondering, you know, um, do you think being a trustee like that work might help a young person in that regard? Um, I think I think there are several ways in which it could help. Yeah. First is to um, to boost your your self confidence. Definitely. To give you practice at seeing an organisation from the top down rather than the bottom up. Mm. Um in a fairly safe environment because you're on, you're one of a group of trustees and the responsibility is shared between you all. Yeah. You're not, it's not like taking being appointed as um, a senior management role in an organization where you are solely responsible for your, your particular job and people will breathe down your neck. If you get it wrong, all of the decisions taken within trustee groups are shared, shared responsibility. Yeah. And they're there um, to support you. Yeah, so so you're not you're not doing it on your own. Um, I think it helps us helps us all to grow as individuals. Mm. Um, there's an awful lot of of learning that goes on in the process about yourself and about how to behave, how to conduct yourself, how to represent an organisation, how to um, communicate. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I, I would also say, particularly for younger people, but for anyone really, particularly for younger people, um, a, f a phrase that you hear a lot these days is networking. And yeah. a few better ways to network with people in, in um, positions of significance than by joining a trustee team. Yeah. Uh, you'd be surprised who you will come across. And they will be very open to interaction with you uh, right from the first time you meet them if they know that you're coming to them as a trustee. Excellent. Couldn't have said it better myself. That's brilliant. So I, I do hope that there are some young people listening to this um, and uh, thinking about um, getting a little bit of trusteeship under your belt. And um, and also on your CV, which is kind of like really the one of the largest benefits of doing this, as well as all the information. And, um, and another one of the um, good things that some one of our uh, interview uh, E's pointed out last week was that... Um, they're surrounded by one of the best knowledge bases that they could ever get in their life. Yeah. Um, all of those people of different ages, of different strata and different, you know, areas of society, different paths of life, all coming together with their particular bits of knowledge. And you've got that there on tap um, whilst you're during the time that you're trustee. Um, yeah. And uh, that that would be quite invaluable for uh, anyone at that age starting out in their um, career life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a great development opportunity for people. Mm. So, um, what's next up for you and um, Celtic Harmony? Then you've got um, um, uh, your AGM coming up or anything like that? Uh, yeah, actually, the next trustee meeting acts as our AGM. Um, yeah, next month uh, we. The the, the organisation has developed hugely in the last um, seven or eight years. Mm. We we effectively run a a small recreation of a Celtic village. That's right. Uh, yeah. We originally we originally built two Celtic roundhouses, and that's what we operated from. And about five or six years ago, we managed to to secure funding to build five more. Um, smaller, but uh, around a central area, which has turned the whole thing into it actually started make, to make it feel like a village. So it does, yeah, it looks like it on the photograph. When the kids arrive, it feels like a village. You only need yeah. a few actors in there and, and you're away. Um, and then we had this mad idea uh, about a year before um, lockdown all started 
that we would because we we have kids in the outdoors we were having to shut things down for um sort of november december january february so a third of the year was out of out of action for us and we said well if we actually had a a decent proper building there we could avoid that so we started trying to fundraise to build a um, a huge modern building, but hidden in a way that it still fits in with the the whole ethos of the thing. So yeah. it looks like the front of it is is timbered so that it looks like a palisade fence around the outside of the uh, fortified fence around the outside of the village. Yeah, but behind it is this big building, um, and we worked out that it was going to cost nearly a million quid to do. Oh blimey! For a small charity, is a hell of a thing to think about. Absolutely. Um, and we we managed to get planning for it. We managed to to get funding for most of it. We built most of it. Um, uh, we couldn't afford to do the whole thing, so it's it's in um, a, a typical industrial type building, really built in sections. And we put some of the sections in, but not all of them. And we've just decided that because the funds look good at the moment, and we've got an offer of financial support to finish it off, we're going to do that. So. That's going to be the big project for the next year or two. Is Brilliant. To, to oh, get, I'm going to have to get interview. Sarah back in for another interview then. <laughs> and that has been a, a, a huge change to the to the site. It's meant that we can have school kids in any month of the year. Yeah. Uh, if it's pouring with rain, we can still give them a good day. And it's just the facilities on site have improved so much. Yeah. You must have been well chuffed um, to get the recent award for being the best... Uh, Best Kids School Day Out um, Award. <laughs> yes, yeah, very much so. It's, that's really a reflection on Claire and Luca and the staff rather than us as trustees. I mean, the work they put in yeah. is, is phenomenal. Um, and, and I've seen it from both sides. I mean, my my daughter's now coming up, uh, she's 23 and a half, um, and she attended the site quite a few times with me and with school when she was a primary school child. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've seen it from both sides. And the kids get so much out of it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the pleasure is seeing what the kids get out of it. Yeah, because I mentioned when I was interviewing Sarah that we have over in Hemel, they're here, they're, we've got the Boxmore Trust, and they do um, a thing called Forest School in yes. a dedicated area where they take the kids up there and they teach them all about outdoor stuff and, you know, getting them away from their electronic devices and tablets and things like that. Yeah, um, and if you can, just if you can structure brilliant. it right and really engage with them, then the kids get so much out of it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So I love kids, the videos that you've been really posting. Yeah, and so how what, how what sort of like distance uh, do you get the youngsters coming in from? Do you know at all? <laughs> the, I suppose eighty percent of the kids that come to us come from Hertfordshire and North London. Yeah, um, we do have kids coming in from sort of the, the the northern fringe of central London. But we have had um, coach loads of, of school kids come from as far afield as Birmingham. Wow. Um, the problem there, of course, is that we, un until we had this this building and the, um, the new roundhouses, uh, we could only run uh, kids on site for a for one day at a time. Yeah, and that meant if you were travelling more than about an hour and a half to get there, then you just didn't get a decent day out of it. No, no. Well, since we've had these improved facilities, we've actually been able to to um, accommodate groups of children overnight. Oh wow, they must and, love that. And kids can go. The, the, the schools can choose to either do a, a day or two or three days with overnight stays. But if you're doing two or three days then it makes sense of coming further. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds awesome. So um, yeah, the new um, community engagement officer role uh, that you've got there is going to be involved in increasing those sorts of visits, I would assume. Yes. yes. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. And we're also conscious about, uh, as although we are very much about getting school kids out into, the, into a natural environment and th hung around the theme of prehistory, um, we are also very aware that we are part of the local community. So during the school holidays, we try to run events um, that allow the general public to come in and make use of the site. Uh, so for the what we tend to do is, is 
theme them around um the uh, celebrations through the year so the summer solstice and yeah um, the Sawain, um recently in the autumn um yeah and we'll we'll run uh, an event where we might have four or five hundred of the general public come in wow and by doing that you you know you, again you get talking to people when you're in those events uh to parents and um kids perhaps who've who come along who've grown up who, who came to us when they were younger and that's a great place to find volunteers for the site and potential trustees yeah absolutely and continuing to raise awareness of the, the fact that you're there yes yeah yeah brilliant well, um, we're uh, just about coming towards the end of our um, allotted time. So um, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Ian, for coming along and chatting with us about um, uh, all, all things trusteeship, including your own uh, trustee, trustee point of view. I've interviewed a few of you now, and I absolutely love what you're doing. But thank right. you so much for joining us today. All yeah. right. Cheers. I'll speak to you later. See you later. Bye.